Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to import parts into Fishbowl. This is Lance with Brando Consulting, Fishbowl inventory expert since 2006. Basically, this video is going to cover the PPVP, also known as the Part Product Vendor Pricing Spreadsheet, which includes your part numbers, your descriptions, your units of measure, your UPCs, your part types, um, standard costs if you're in a standard costing method. I'll even touch on account types um, and specifically account mapping. I'll also touch on part tracking, vendor costs, basically an overview of the part product vendor pricing spreadsheet, how to prepare it correctly so you can get a successful message after clicking finish. So to start, you'll go to the top left hand corner, click file, import or export. The part product vendor pricing spreadsheet will be used on either one of those. Now, if you're going to import the part product vendor pricing spreadsheet, select import. And then a little trick, you can click right here and just type the word part and it'll narrow down the list. And there you see the part product vendor pricing spreadsheet. Then right here, you can export a template. That's nice. If you export a template, you get a nice, easy to read, fresh, clean spreadsheet to look at and and start from and and then of course once you have the spreadsheet prepared correctly this is where you'll do the actual import now let's talk about preparing the spreadsheet correctly notice it says print instructions always a great idea i wouldn't discourage it go ahead and print these out these are helpful tell you what uh, required fields and what isn't required what your shortcuts can be but this is what we're going to go over right here okay so let's look at that. I'll cancel that and pull over the part product vendor pricing spreadsheet. Here's the thing we're interested in right here. So we've got the part number. First of all, when you're first starting to use inventory software for the first time, you may do what a lot of people do, and that is create a glorified description. When you're thinking about creating part numbers, Remember to keep your part numbers short, alphanumeric, under eight to nine characters without dashes, spaces, or symbols. This makes it really easy to read the part number on a mobile device, which is a tiny, small screen in the warehouse. So think about scalability. Um, if you're thinking about using UPCs, a good idea for a part number is the five digits, the second half of, of the UPC code, the five digits in the second half of the UPC code. Okay, so we've got description, put good keywords in your description, make your parts easy to find because in Fishbowl, um, you can search anywhere by description. So if you're worried about not having your keywords and your part number, don't worry about that. The description is searchable everywhere in Fishbowl. Now, unit of measure is very important to get right the first time. If your units of measure aren't right, it can lead to disaster later on. I personally have helped companies rebuild their entire file because they started out with wrong units of measure. So if you need help, or have questions about units of measure, make sure to see my YouTube video on units of measure. Okay, so now you see something happening here in my UPC column. It's got the scientific notation taking over the world. This is common with using Excel spreadsheets. Remember when you're creating part numbers, when you're using um, account names or even in the customer import, you're going to be working with Excel spreadsheets. So really try hard to avoid having um, characters that are going to be slaughtered by Excel. Leading zeros are an also, also a concern. So try to avoid leading zeros. Now this UPC, I don't know what that is. It's not an actual UPC. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of it. Quick trick, um, something I always do in the Excel spreadsheet is I turn on filters. Easiest way to do that is to click data, then click um, filter. Now my filter is grayed out because I forgot to select all. I go to this little area right here, select all, click filter, and now you see I've got these little drop downs that I can sort and filter with. So I'm just going to check this column, this UPC column, and check to see if I've got any other data. Those UPCs look okay. 
All right. Now the part type. This is one good thing to crack open your uh, instructions as a reminder. It's really hard to remember what these codes are. 10 is inventory, 20 is non-inventory, 21 is labor, 22 is service, and um, actually I messed that up. 30 is non-inventory. See, I probably need to look at it too as a refresher. 60 is shipping, 50 I think is overhead. So yeah, take a look at what these part types are. It's very important to get your part type correct at, at the get-go because part types affect accounting. All right, what account is mapped to by default if you don't uh, connect to the account, if you don't map the account specifically. So take a look at the instructions and make sure you know what the part types are and they're assigned correctly. Now, if you need to change your part type, unfortunately, you can't do it on this import. You need to inactivate the part, change the part number, and create a new part type. The only exception to that is if you're changing non-inventory type parts, which is your type ID 30. If you're changing that, you can change it, but you can only change it one at a time inside the system. It can't be changed on an import on this spreadsheet. Okay, you can inactivate and activate parts. That's good, we'll keep going. Standard cost. The standard cost field is used on inventory type parts only when you choose the standard costing method in Fishbowl. I'll go there quickly here to accounting. And this is what I'm talking about, guys, under accounting, tools, module options, costing. This is where your costing method is found. If you want to know what your costing method is, check there. If this says standard, then you absolutely need all these fields filled in with a cost or your costing is going to get off. Now, um, the standard costing method is used for all your other part types. So if you have services, labor, especially labor, um, you need a standard cost for that, especially if you're in manufacturing and you're consuming labor or that's that's going to not be good. So make sure you've got your standard cost filled out. All right, so these next fields here, I'll just expand that, double click, there we go. You've got your lot number, revision, expiration, serial. So you can turn lot number tracking, you can turn these things on and off in mass from an import, great, powerful tool there. And um, only caveat is, you can't turn tracking on from a mass import if you have quantity already in stock. Fishbowl won't let you do that because as soon as you turn the tracking on, it wants to know what the tracking value is for the quantity in stock. And that can't be done. Now, if you want to do it in mass, simply do a cycle count adjustment, a mass cycle count adjustment, bring it all to zero. Then you can come back to this and um, turn it on and then go back and do the add inventory spreadsheet or the cycle count spreadsheet and put those put those lot numbers and or serial numbers back in there one good thing to bring up right now with serial numbers is they go hand in hand with the unit of measure of each so you need to have a unit of measure of each if you're going to do use serial number tracking that's the main thing each is for and each unit of measure cannot be fractioned. A serial number cannot be fractioned either. Okay, let's go on. Scroll to the right. We've got, um, this is interesting. This particular file that I have, have has a custom tracking value. You won't, you won't see that um, unless you add that custom tracking value. Now let's look at this here. Asset account. I like to do something when I'm setting this up just to help remind my clients that this column has a dual purpose. So I put my cursor here, hold down the Alt key, hit Enter, and I add expense account. So what I'm reminding my clients of is, is Fishbowl uses this column for two reasons. Asset accounts for inventory type parts 
and this should be an expense account for other all other types of parts that are not inventory. So let me hide this and drive this point home. So if the part type ID is 10, that means it's an inventory type part, and this should be an asset account. If the part type ID is not 10, then this plays a role for expenses, and an inventory type account should not be there. An expense account should be there. So if you're purchasing services from a vendor, for instance, Fishbowl is going to debit this expense account and credit the payables account. Um, for shipping, it'll debit a, a shipping expense account and credit the payables account. So keep, keep that in mind. This has a dual purpose. Now, in order to import into Fishbowl, Fishbowl does not accept my little note. Uh, you do have to have the column uh, set to the requirements Fishbowl sets here. But just, just a little trick. Another point I want to make on this is you have to get the name to match correctly. Look at how it says Fishbowl Inventory Asset colon Material Space Inventory. Now, a lot of people struggle with this import. If you're struggling to get this to match while importing into Fishbowl, a good little trick is to go to the part screen. It doesn't matter which part you pull up, just grab one, any one. Go to the accounting screen and just type in, let's say, inventory. If you want to know exactly what account you're trying to grab, select the account that matches, copy it, control C, go to the spreadsheet and paste it there and then mass copy it down. Sometimes I see people with a space there or maybe it'll say material inventory instead of materials inventory. It has to match exactly. Okay. Um, COGS account. One thing to remember is the COGS account is not used unless you are going to sell it. That's right. Now you can put a COGS account in in this column if you are going to represent parts that are not inventory type parts and, and that can work fine. It's, a, it's just a different place on the same P&L. That's up to you whether you want it at the top of the P&L or the bottom of the P&L. Um, but remember this column right here, whatever account you put in this column, Fishbowl is only going to use it if you actually sell the product from a sales order. So when setting this up, a good um, practice is to cut this column, scroll all the way over to the right, and insert it next to the income account. Now that just helps remind you that this is only used when a product is sold on a sales order. Now, it won't import like this. After you filled this out, cut it again, and before you import it back into Fishbowl, paste it back over here. So I just do that just to remind my clients that Fishbowl does not use the data in this column unless it's sold on a sales order. Okay, let's keep going. Adjustment account, scrap account, variance account. Now, these are blank in this exercise, in this example, and that is typical. Usually you'll have one adjustment account for everything. So if this column is blank, then Fishbowl is going to use the default account. If you want a reminder of what your default account is, go to the report screen in Fishbowl, type in DEF as a quick search, and there's a report right there to show you what your default accounts are. So in this example, my scrapped inventory, if it's blank on the spreadsheet, will be mapped to an account in QuickBooks called scrapped inventory. Okay, let's move on. ABC code. Now, if you have popular parts that you need to define healthy inventory stock levels for. This is a great tool for you. Fishbowl will actually automatically set the ABC code for you if it if you use its auto ABC tool. But if you're just starting to use Fishbowl for the same time, obviously Fishbowl won't know what parts are most popular. So you may want to decide to tell Fishbowl what your A-class parts are. Basically an A-class part is something that is popular, a B-class part is semi-popular, and a C-class part you may want to consider maybe doing away with it, right? 
So once you identify your A-class parts, then the next step you can set healthy stock levels for them, min and max levels, reorder points, and Fishbowl will become a more powerful tool to help you manage your stock levels. So that's the ABC code. You can put an A next to the parts that are popular. You can set weight, width, height, and length. If you set weight, Fishbowl will automatically sum up the weight for an entire order when you ship it. So that can be useful. Notice a part has a URL if you want to link it to some schematics outside of Fishbowl and then custom fields. Okay, now here are your products. A product is simply a part that is for sale. Everything in Fishbowl is a part, but not everything in Fishbowl is a product. If you buy it, it's a part. If you manufacture it, it's a part. A product is something that goes on a sales order and is shipped to the customer. It's just the Fishbowl language. When learning a new software, you have to get used to the language that the software uses. Oftentimes in Fishbowl, a part doubles as your stock keeping unit, same as your SKU. So if your part is not for sale, then you can leave this blank. Here's an example right here. This particular part is not sold. Now, in order to make this easy to view and work with, another thing I always do is freeze panes. I'll click right here, go to view, freeze panes. Now when I scroll to the right, I don't miss what parts I'm looking at. And when I scroll up and down, I don't miss the column up above. So now we can see what this is. It's a coding service. That's something that we purchased from the vendor. We'll never sell it, so that's set up properly. Here's your standard price. That's not required if you have pricing rules, but it's good to put that in if you do use it. Product SKU. Notice how many fields in Fishbowl there are for identifying your part. The UPC, the SKU, the part, the product. And even when we scroll over here, we actually have a vendor part number. If you put the UPC in Fishbowl, then it can read the UPC. If you put the vendor part number in Fishbowl and they have a barcode, Fishbowl will be able to read that. If you have an SKU, a product number, Fishbowl can identify all of them and know what you're talking about. So if you have the data, put it in there. Here's our UPC. We've got to double check it. Yeah, that UPC is no good. It's definitely not a UPC. Let's perform a little bit of cleanup here. A UPC is a 12 digit code. So I'm going to change the format to custom zero and I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And there we go. Now you see why it's changing it to something wonky is it has leading zeros. I took care of the leading zeros by changing the formatting. Product active, product taxable, product SO item type ID. Take a look at your instructions for this one. There is sales, drop ship, and credit return. Let's translate this into what Fishbowl says on its product screen. I'm back on the product screen on the details tab. It says SO item type sale, and there's two other options, drop ship and credit return. Okay, here's our income account. Make sure that matches exactly. And this column right here maps to this field right here on your product screen. In order to have a successful import, you need to first connect Fishbowl to QuickBooks so it sees the accounts. Make sure that's done first. Now we have product weight, width, height. Product weight helps when you're shipping the product. Now a common error message I see with people trying to import this for the first time is mismatched vendor names. This vendor name right here has to match the vendor name in Fishbowl exactly. If you can't find it on this list on the vendor screen, then you're gonna get an error message when you try to import it. Either change the vendor name in Fishbowl or change the vendor name on the spreadsheet to get it right. It's good to assign a vendor to a part. That way your purchasing tools will work better the auto PO tool, the auto PO report, for instance. Notice vendors can have their own part numbers that can be different from our part numbers. That's usual and totally fine. It's actually a good practice to make your vendor part number different from your product number so your customer can't Google the product number and find out who your supplier is. So here we have the vendor name, the vendor part number, 
the vendor unit of measure you purchase it in and the cost for that unit of measure. Remember the cost and unit of measure go together. Another common error message is a unit of measure conversion error. Make sure that there is a unit of measure conversion between the vendor unit of measure and way over here to the left, your part unit of measure. Okay, now that we have the part product vendor pricing spreadsheet prepared, that's probably one of the biggest jobs is just preparing that data, getting it all right, getting it on there. Now that it's prepared, we can start to try to import it. Don't get discouraged if you get an error message on the first time. No one gets it right the first time. Patiently read the error messages. They'll tell you what line the error is on and, and work through it and, and you'll get through it. So the name of this spreadsheet is PP Vendor Pricing. That's the default name. After you prepare it, you may want to rename it and call it PP Vendor Pricing Ready to Import or whatever you want to call it. So when you're ready to import, go to Fishbowl, go to File, Import, click, type in Part, select Part Product Vendor Pricing. Next, next, browse to the file. There it is. Part Product Vendor Pricing Ready to Import. Next. 78 lines, you may have 700, 7,000, 70,000. If you have a large number of lines, like over 10,000, consider breaking up your spreadsheet into five to 10,000 increments. Although Fishbowl may be able to handle the volume, it can become more frustrating to import it because let's say you get something wrong and you get an error message. And the error message is on line 3,000 or 10,000. You just waited, I don't know, two, three, four, maybe five minutes for Fishbowl to validate 10,000 lines and then get an error message. Some of these spreadsheets will import partial imports. Some of them won't. Some of them are an all or nothing thing. So even though Fishbowl can handle the volume, it's easier to manage if you break it up and shrink the imports. Okay, let's go ahead and import this. So let's click finish and successful. Now, obviously I've done this before or I wouldn't have gotten a success on the first try. I don't even get successes on the first try. So if you have any questions, comment below. If you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe.